Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And um, I would especially like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here today about a topic um, that I think will really shape clinical applications and pathology in particular over the next years at the Future Clinical Applications Symposium. In my talk, I will outline how the integration of molecular and digital pathology reflects a key paradigm change in how we handle clinical data. And this is really enabled by the digital transformation that we're presently seeing. I will then dive into specific application areas in more details. This is how pathology has looked like for the past 100 years. Light microscopy really generates beautiful high resolution images, but they are fully analog and cannot be processed further. So I like to liken this to these old beautiful analog maps. You can really uh, find all the information that you need on these maps, but you can only look at them uh, in any one place at one time, and they're really limited in terms of uh, what you can do with these. The digitalization of this data comes with a massive increase in the availability of digital information. It can be mined using state-of-the-art bioinformatics and artificial intelligence tools. This is powered by the increased availability of uh, slide scanners for the digitalization of clinical trials and standard diagnostic workflows. Full digitalization at WISTSET, for example, would allow to generate approximately half a million digital slides per year, which corresponds to about 0.5 petabytes of image data. This is paralleled by the decreasing cost for sequencing and the increased availability of well annotated genomic data sets. But instead of uh, drowning in the data, we can use bioinformatics and artificial intelligence tools to really extract morphomolecular patterns that were previously inaccessible to the human eye and thereby inaccessible to clinical use. And there are two key approaches and methods um, that we've seen here in, in research in the first clinical applications. These are derived from computer vision in combination with statistical learning. And a common approach here is to use an end-to-end -end data driven approach uh, utilizing neural networks that allow us to detect abstract patterns in pathology images that are associated with clinical pathological features. These methods are incredibly powerful for the mining of large image data sets with structured metadata. The second approach uses prior domain knowledge, so the knowledge that's really been developed um, by pathologists in the daily diagnostic practice to specifically engineer features to be analyzed with AI. And these could be known features related to cancer biology, such as mitosis, glandular structures, immune infiltrates, stromal content, and the like. And these methods are very useful in building a toolbox for the reproducible quantification of morphological prognostic and predictive indicators. Importantly, this AI-based classification now allows us to really iteratively improve our understanding of how morphology is impacting by underlying genomic changes and how this information can be used to guide patient stratification in clinical and research workflows. Until now, there was really limited information of how the morphology that we see in a given cancer is related to the molecular phenotypes and how, on the other hand, we can use the molecular phenotype um, to find novel morphologically informed stratification methods. And I want to now show you um, how specific applications have been derived to connect these two different levels of information that really have increasing clinical value. So the current state of the art um, means that we already have histology slides generated around the world um, at a high standard um, using standard H&E sections in a diagnostic workup. However, the accessing the genomic information and also the transcriptional or methylation um, generates significant costs. It, it needs infrastructure, it needs know-how, and this is uh, currently a bottleneck um, that we would be able to overcome if we directly use these existing uh, images to correlate tissue morphology with specific profiles that have value for the classification of disease, but also the development of prognostic and predictive indicators. For example, we could use morphological signatures as a surrogate for specific genetic or molecular um, genotypes that can then inform clinical practice. This could lead to the prioritization of patients for molecular testing just based on their daily diagnostic um, pathology slides. We could efficiently screen for hereditary cancer syndromes such as the Lynch syndrome or others where we know there is a certain um, morphological representation. But we could also use this information to better um, stratify patients to clinical interventions and treatment decisions. In particular, there are certain bottlenecks at the moment that are insufficiently addressed with this present state of the art, so the present uh, pathological um, stratification, just using anatomic information or limited molecular information to go with this, in particular in early stage disease, but also in advanced disease, where sometimes it can be very difficult to accurately decide which patient should receive new adjuvant or adjuvant treatment and with which drug. 
There have been some really exciting developments here, and I want to highlight some of the um, most um, exciting studies over the past year. This was the, one of the first studies that came out showing um, in non-small cell lung cancer that it is possible just using the H and E image um, to not only predict the lung tumor subtype, so the stratification into adenocarcinoma versus squamous cell carcinoma, which is um, relevant for clinical practice, but also to derive information on targetable alterations just from the um, image data using deep learning. And you can see here that there were moderate to good um, AUCs achieved for these uh, relatively common um, genomic driver alterations. Now, interestingly, and this is uh, something that, that I think is really empowered by the image, is that we can now correlate the pattern of genomic alterations in a spatial manner to the actual image of the cancer. And you can see this here. Um, basically, this, this uh, pipeline generates little image tiles. And for each image tile, there is a likelihood of this image feature being represented or associated with a specific genomic driver alteration. And by this, you achieve spatial resolution of where these mutations are actually present, giving a deeper insight into uh, the clonal heterogeneity of these tumors and allowing a deeper biological understanding than is easily achievable with current genomic methods, where basically you just scratch off all of the tissue on the slide and interrogate it for certain features. A second um, key paper here um, that is really exciting um, is here from the uh, Carter Group in Heidelberg where it was shown that um, entity agnostic, prognostic, and predictive biomarkers such as microsatellite instability, which really has a big impact for um, predictive stratification at the moment for immunotherapy, can be derived across the gastrointestinal tract from image data. And you can see this here. This was derived from uh, the TCGA data set. It's only 360 patients with a validation on 378 patients, but already an AUC of 0.84 can be achieved for identifying gastrointestinal cancers with the MSI phenotype. And you can see here that this also correlates with um, underlying uh, transcriptional signatures as well as immunohistochemistry based infiltration by CD8 cells, well known features of the MSI um, genotype. So, very exciting work here. And I think what's even more uh, exciting is that just one year later, um, we go from this. Uh, cohort of only 300 patients um, with an AUC to zero, of 0 0.84 to a almost clinical grade essay um, here published by the same group, bringing together four large international data sets with genomic data and showing um, that just using the H&E image, you can generate clinical grade um, detection and classification of MSI. And we're already in the range of, um, of the standard essays that we're using based on immunist chemistry to detect this genotype. So the development in the field is incredibly fast. And now we have shown that um, just this year, it's not just possible to detect these very um, uh, prominent um, molecular driver mutations and, and uh, genotypes that are um, built on the, uh, or, or um, impacted by key genomic alterations that really affect a lot of pathways, but that we can also derive the specific transcriptional subtypes um, in cancer just using image information. And uh, in this study, we focused on the consensus molecular subtypes of colorectal cancer, which were first published by the Guinea group in 2015 in Nature Medicine. And the reason why we chose these subtypes is because they are of key importance for colorectal cancer research, as they correspond to defined biological subgroups with distinct clinical behavior. And we know that there are close associations with uh, specific um, clinical um, outcomes as well as uh, specific clinical mutations. So here, um, the first subgroup um, that, that is very important is the CMS1 subgroup. This is uh, correlated to the MSI um, genotype in colorectal cancer. It's characterized by immune infiltration and activation. Uh, lots of new antigens that are being generated due to the deficiencies in DNA repair. And in early stages, these uh, cases have a very good outcome, but in late stages, especially after relapse, these cases are very hard to treat um, and are characterized by poor survival. A second important group here is um, the CMS2 group called canonical. It's the most common one characterized by wind and MIG activation and an intermediate prognosis. CMS3, also a very interesting group um, characterized by KRAS mutations, metabolic deregulation, and an intermediate clinical prognosis. And the last group, CMS4, this is uh, the second most common group um, very important clinically, as this is characterized by stromal infiltration, mechanisms of epithelium as in climate transition, activation of TGF beta, and a very poor uh, relapse free and overall survival. And so far, we really haven't known what these cases um, and these 
subtypes look like um, on the histology slide. We had some indications because of the high frequency of MMR cases that CMS1 would uh, be characterized by increased inflammation and that we have a very strong stromal content here in CMS4, but the finer details of this classification and especially the um, morphological representation of CMS2 and CMS3 has been very limited, um, basically forming a bottleneck in the clinical translation of these signatures. And what we here set out um, to achieve together with uh, Oxford, where I was at the time, was uh, to derive a deep learning based classifier, uh, working with uh, several clinical trial cohorts, the focus cohort of um, advanced colorectal cancer, a randomized uh, clinical trial cohort of metastatic disease um, with full treatment information, a TCGA cohort um, that you all know very well, but also a, a very uh, important clinical cohort here um, looking at uh, rectal biopsies uh, specifically, which is a very important clinical setting. And these are specifically hard to characterize using molecular information because the tissue is so limited. So in this study, we were really able to focus on the two key clinical settings um, using resection specimens and full tissue sections, as well as biopsies to develop and test the um, molecular classification of colorectal cancer. Um, all of these cases had a ground truth uh, transcriptional um, data, uh, including the full CMS classification. And what I want to highlight here is that actually, um, even using state-of-the-art um, next generation sequencing methods and RNA sequences, we were unable to classify about a quarter um, of cases and focus. Um, there's about 10% in TCGA and almost 30% in the biopsy cohort that are unable to be classified using uh, conventional bioinformatic methods, either because the calls um, are divergent or there is not enough material, particularly in the um, biopsy cohort, to achieve this uh, um, information from the existing material. So to generate an image-based model, um, we utilize the uh, information from FOCUS. And this is a very unique cohort because we had a one-to-one -one match between the tumor regions that were extracted and the molecular information that was derived from this. So in the model that we generated, um, we used this ground truth information to um, train a model to associate the image information with the um, ground truth CMS groups. At the same time, we used a step um, called domain adversarial training to minimize any learning features that are attributed to a specific cohort. So this helps um, in models where you use uh, several cohorts to really um, emphasize the features in the image data set that are related to your, to your um, classification of interest, in this case, the molecular subgroups, and reduce any learning features that are cohort specific could bias these outcomes. We used a five-fold cross-validation model, uh, which is analog to an example, uh, to an ensemble of um, expert opinions to also reduce the bias of the individual predictions. So in clinical practice, of course, you then get an unseen sample and you want to classify the sample using um, the um, AI model. And to this end, uh, we split up the image information into these little tissue tiles. These are about 200 by 200 microns. And we utilize our ensemble of models to generate a tile classification. And now you can already see the increased level of resolution that we get here as compared to genomic sequencing. We can very nicely resolve the um, transcription patterns spatially across each given case and also derive quantitative metrics as to the primary molecular call of these cases as compared to secondary calls, thereby giving us an additional indication of tumor heterogeneity that we can then investigate with uh, clinical features. And you can see that there is actually a quite a variance um, in the representation of these uh, subgroups across the cohorts. Um, there are cases that are very homogeneous here, um, but there is a, a representation of significant heterogeneity um, in clinical cases that so far has been insufficiently captured. And that is very important and interesting to further investigate. Here's the performance of the image-based classification versus molecular ground truth. Um, on full tissue sections, you can see we achieve an AUC of 0 0.9, TCGA um, validation cohort 0 0.84, and the biopsy is 0 0.85. So very strong um, uh, classification results here using the AI classifier. Importantly, we were also able to resolve um, unclassified cases by molecular data just using the image. And you can see that we were able to reclassify all of these cases across all of the given cohorts to um, image-based classes. But of course, now you can ask, is that correct, um, this, mis this reclassification? And indeed, we can show that there are um, cases that were reclassified um, using just the image data match the originally classified cases exactly in the distribution of the secondary molecular features that we would um, expect between these given classes. So there's a strong in indication here that reclassification using the image data um, is accurate and uh, useful in this way. What is very interesting for me as a pathologist is also that we can now interrogate 
um, the AI-based models to understand which specific morphological patterns associate with the transcriptional subgroup. And what we did is we extracted and uh, visually reviewed those tiles with the highest prediction confidence for each of the IMCMS subtypes. And what you can see here is that we see that um, some of the features that we would expect with, for example, IMCMS1 are also um, very nicely represented here. So the mucinous differentiation, poor tumor differentiation, immune infiltration. The same is true for CMS4, lots of stroma, budding, very aggressive infiltration. So this all fits very well. But what is very interesting for me as a pathologist is that I can now also begin to pick out um, feature sets here that are specific to CMS2 with this cribriform growth pattern and the comedial-like necrosis and CMS3 with this papillary growth and, and mucin. So there's a clear correlation here of the activation of these transcriptional pathways and the molecular classes and the morphology. Um, completely allowing us to reinterpret what these mean um, in terms of how these tumors um, grow. And you can see this representation also at um, the pixel level, again, CMS1 and CMS4 classification informed both by the epithelial compartment and the stroma, while CMS2 and CMS3 are very much driven by this epithelial rich morphology and the, the actual configuration of these um, malignant glands. Um, very relevant, we can now resolve tumor heterogeneity in a spatial manner. So um, on top, you can see the RNA sequencing data. Here we relaxed the original thresholds for a CMS classification to generate a secondary call for each individual case. And you can see the compositions, the heterogeneity of each case um, depicted here in colors. And you can see the image-based representation um, of this uh, below. And you can see that there is an, uh, quite a... a um, a relevant correlation between these patterns, allowing us um, to deeper investigate how these um, transcriptional subtypes are represented in colorectal tumors and what that could mean also in terms of the um, cellular composition and the spatial organization. The consistency of these classifications is very strong. Um, it doesn't depend on the actual section or depth of the tissue that you looked at. So here we uh, generated uh, deeper sections for each case and correlated the image-based calls between this original section and a deeper section. And you can see that these are very strongly um, correlated between the slide pairs, both on the resection specimens as well as on the biopsy tissue. Most important, of course, for clinics is um, can we now use this um, information for uh, prognostic stratification? And I want to show you here the direct comparison between the molecular ground truth calls and the image-based calls in terms of survival stratification. And does this focus, uh, the focus trial stratified by molecular CMS calls, and it shows exactly the pattern that we would like to see or what we would expect, namely that the CMS1 uh, group is the poor prognosis group in this advanced stage disease. Um, TCGA is a mixed cohort, non-randomized. Um, here, um, you don't see this very clear pattern. The CMS4 here um, is, and the CMS1s are the, uh, compared to the CMS3 are the best, uh, the, the worst prognosis group. But um, what is, I think very striking here is that if we just use the HE image information, we can repre represent um, the exact same uh, prognostic classification just using the HE without any secondary molecular data. Um, the prognostic association of the IMCMS classification was also maintained in multivariable analysis, including all of the conventional uh, prognostic indicators, showing that this has a strong potential to stratify beyond the established pathological risk factors. So with this, um, I would like to conclude that um, I could show you some uh, indications that computation models can now predict key molecular signatures and transcriptional tumor subtypes from standard histology sections. We can use this approach to make sequencing information more interpretable by associating morphology, molecular features, and outcome data. We can classify samples that are previously unclassifiable by genomic methods using the image information, thereby getting a novel insight into tumor heterogeneity and getting access to prognostic information that would otherwise be lost. Last, we can use these image-based classifiers now to really um, investigate existing cohorts, um, not only routine workflows, but also um, existing clinical trial sets to get a deeper insight of what these transcriptional profiles mean in terms of a treatment response. And we're here um, currently collaborating with the Transcot trial group um, to investigate the CMS groups and their impact on chemotherapy response in a um, large randomized clinical trial of over 3,000 patients. 
And with that, I'd like to close um, and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Um, this is the computational and translational pathology lab here at uh, Wurstset that we've established that is growing rapidly. And of course, uh, none of this work on the international trials would have been possible without very strong um, international partnerships in particular with Oxford, uh, but also um, across the UK. So um, thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Victor, thank you so much for, for this really um, broad and amazing talk. And um, clearly, we'll see much new things coming out of your lab. Um, I'm taking up a question from the Q&A about um, batch effects across scanners. And maybe that's something you surely uh, can answer. So um, you know, it's important to kind of integrate data from a lot of different sources and different sources of different scanners. Um, are there any foreseen problems here? Mm -hmm. So a very, very important question. Um, so there's two um, approaches that we take as a standard to adjust for this. Um, one is we use um, very strong, um, or we include very strong augmentation um, methods for each of the cohorts. So we um, vary by color, um, yeah any, any um, standard machine learning approaches to um, enhance the representation of, of different image features um, are employed. The second is the um, uh, approach that we use with the domain adversarial training, um, where basically we, um, we already utilize part of the data from the three different cohorts to minimize the classification weights um, that are associated with cohort specific features that could also be scanning or staining specific features um, and pull out those um, features that are most relevant for the classification. So technically, this is basically like a second deep neural network um, that works against the molecular classifier. And what we want to achieve in the convergence of the networks is that the, the domain adversarial network actually performs very poorly. It's trying to differentiate the cohort. So we want to do this to perform very, very poorly against the, uh, the molecular classifier where we want to achieve the, the maximum um, performance. So basically it's, it's a second deep neural network that we have um, that um, utilizes part of the data to decrease the classification weights of any features that are uh, preparation specific. The last part, at least in our study, is that we um, are already including um, cohorts from different scanners um, and uh, different centers. So the focus cohort is from 80 different centers. So you have um, variation across the cases, um, across many, many different stainers. Um, uh, and this variation is already um, in, in here into the model. And, and this is also why it generalizes so well. Wonderful. Um... I had a question with now Ashil Batavia. Is that still valid or? Uh, no, it's okay. It's, it's uh, kind of already been I have a quick question. Oh. You've, you've been answered. Oh, it's been answered. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. I, I have a question that uh, re relates also to my talk later, kind of um, about you know when will we see any AI in the clinic, like assistive AI, for example, like that helps you interpret the images and. Um, helps you kind of make a decision and a diagnostic decision. I mean, where are we? Um, are there kind of low hanging goals and early goals or is that something we have? Yes. Um, so there's already a number of applications that actually have uh, received clinical approval. Um, most of these are really um, from this um, expert knowledge driven domains. So they're not as much from the end to end um, machine learning um, approaches, but they are um, focused on applications that really try to improve our day to day diagnostic practice as it already exists. So there's an FDA approved algorithm, for example, for prostate cancer detection um, from MSKCC. Um, from a startup company there um, that has received a lot of attention. Um, this has been shown to um, really reach very high sensitivity and specificity, so above 95% in clinical application and has received an FDA label just last year. We've got several um, applications uh, also from European companies that have received CE labels. There's some very interesting approaches there, um, basically in two areas. One is pre-screening, where the AI algorithm directly pre-screens any image data before the pathologist sees it and highlights specific areas on the slide that have a probability, for example, of being cancer. The second area is quality control, where basically slides that have already been seen by the pathologist are internally reviewed and slides that might have um, any errors are um, re-entered into the system um, to um, 
can potentially catch any errors. And there's some very interesting studies there coming out of um, Israel, actually, with um, together with the startup company from a very large clinical consortium there that have shown that about 5% of um, errors um, can be uh, caught um, with the um, addition of these um, AI applications. So there's some very good um, indications that AI okay. and pathologists can work together very efficiently and actually perform better in combination than either alone. Right. Um, great. And Mark, um, I think you have uh, one question. Yeah, just a short question. So I'm intrigued by the, um, the fact that the cribriform growth that you saw, because we're also seeing cribriform growth in prostate cancer, which is a considered a, a bad um, a prognostic sign. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you think that um, you're really looking at proliferation and that's what's sort of being identified or is it is it more complicated than just that? That's, that's, I think that's an excellent question. So um, I think we're looking at stem cell dynamics. In, in a way, um, especially if we look at epithelial morphology. There's some very interesting research in colorectal cancer, some of which we've also participated in, um, showing that um, depending on which molecular pathway um, we go down. So in particular, you know, a good example is the TSA, so the traditional serrated adenomas that form these ectopic crypts and then um, give rise to serrated lesions. In these um, cancers, you really see a shift of the stem cell compartment from the normal uh, polar polarized uh, bottom of the crypt towards the sides with new stem cell areas arising, which really shape the morphology of the entire cancer. So I, I would expect that in these um, cancers, um, so CMS2 is what you're referring to, um, which is the canonical pathway, probably the, the wind dysregulation that we're seeing really has a strong impact of how these cancers proliferate and that is reflected in the morphology. Thank you. Okay, this, uh, I see one more question from um, a panelist from Yanis Xenarios. As, as in general kind of, do you think the traditional pathology, like it, which is essentially image-based, um, how much will it be complemented by, let's say, spatial expression profile? I mean, will that be an essential part of diagnostic activity or will it be a sideshow? Um, I think it, it will be a central show in research um, for probably the next five to 10 years. Um, I think there is so much to be learned from spatial distribution and organization. You know, how do immune cells distribute across the tumor uh, and how does that impact response to immunotherapy, for example? Um, you know, how does the stroma interact with the tumor? This whole intercompartmental interaction really hasn't been targeted. And I think there's a lot to be learned there um, so far. And I think this is, you know, this is driven by our understanding of cancer all the genomics is really very much focused on somatic alterations. And, and I think the, the transition that we're seeing here is towards a better understanding of the microenvironment and how that impacts um, cancer treatment responses and outcomes. And this is informed by transcriptomics. But there's a lot more to be learned at this stage before we can pull out specific genes or specific patterns that really go into the clinic. I think there's some initial, um, you know, some initial interesting applications, the immunoscore, for example, a digital assessment of, of ET cell infiltrates that is closer to the clinic than others, um, but it's it's one of the of the very unique examples there. So I think mostly research for the first instance, and then some really interesting um, specific targets that will move make it to the clinic. Okay. 